President Nicolas Maduro is fighting for his political life as more than 50 countries, including the United States, no longer recognize him as Venezuela's legitimate leader. At home, the situation is even more dire. Grocery stores have had bare shelves for years, but now Maduro has had to announce the rationing of electricity for the next 30 days. The controlled outages are meant to relieve Venezuela's strained power grid, but it'll force schools to shut down and businesses to close halfway through the day. It's a blow to Maduro's supporters, so reinforcements have been called in. During the past week, dozens of Russian soldiers and a shipment of Chinese humanitarian aid have landed in Venezuela, along with thousands of Cubans who are thought to be working for Venezuela's intelligence services. So what are they all doing there? Well, let's ask our panel. In Paris is Temir Porras. He's the former chief of staff to President Nicolas Maduro and advisor to Hugo Chavez. In Toronto is Alessandra Polga, a spokeswoman for the opposition Vente Venezuela Party. And joining us from Washington, D.C. is Pedro Mario Purelli. He's a former executive board member of the country's state-owned oil firm Petróleos de Venezuela. I thank you all for joining us. Temri, let me start with you. Is it a sign of weakness from Maduro that he's had to ask for Vladimir Putin's help? Well, uh, there's no, I mean, it's no secret that Venezuela is going through a economic and social crisis. So, um, you know, everybody in the country understands that, that the country needs economic recovery, uh, needs uh, international help, if you will, uh, to get uh, out of the current situation. So, no, I, I don't think it's a sign of, of, I mean, I don't think that that in particular is a, is a, sign, of, is a sign of weakness. Um, I would have preferred, of course, that uh, a broader coalition, if you will, mm -hmm. of political forces and social forces in Venezuela would agree on a, um, I would say, more uh, comprehensive um, humanitarian aid following the protocols of humanitarian action, of course, uh, in order to assist Venezuelan authorities in, in tackling these very serious problems. Okay, but Temer, would you accept that a lot of them have suspicions when the Russians don't only come with aid, they come with soldiers. And there, there are even pictures doing the rounds of Chinese humanitarian aid delivered by people who look like soldiers on places like Margarita Island. It looks like Maduro is trying to inoculate himself from a U.S. invasion rather than feed his people. Well, again, uh, one needs to understand the current situation of the country. Um, Venezuela is under the threat of, of, of military action. The U.S. government has threatened uh, the Venezuelan government of, you know, it has repeatedly said that all options are on the table. And on the other hand, um, Venezuela has a, I would say, long-lasting um, military cooperation with Russia. Um, from at least 2006, when the U.S. banned uh, all you know, weapons sales uh, to Venezuela, Venezuela basically switched and, and, and established a military alliance uh, with Russia, among mm -hmm. other uh, countries in the world, but especially with, with Russia. And, and what we have seen in the, in the, in the past days, again, it's, yes, of course, symbolic. It's a sign that is sent from Venezuela and from Russia to, right. the, uh, to those in the U.S. who are advocating for this crazy idea of, of a military action. Uh, but again, um, I think that the, con the country should, and the international community and the country should uh, turn to more pressing issues, which okay. is, once again, finding a Venezuelan solution to the current crisis so that we can address uh, the problems of the Venezuelan people. Okay, so, Alessandra, Maduro is threatened by the U.S., and Trump has threatened Maduro, and he's taking precautions, no more, no less. Uh, I think that this is a manipulation. He's not, this is not true that Maduro is threatened by Trump. The humanitarian crisis in Venezuela is human-made. It's, it's responsibility for the very bad administration of the Maduro regime. Um, the reason that he is not recognized right now is because he he went with a sham election uh, in May 20th. Nobody recognized the result. At the at the end, we we don't have. He's not any longer the president of Venezuela, and up to our constitution, we have now Juan Guaido as a interim president in Venezuela. The problem that we had with the blackout of the uh, lacks of uh, hydro energy 
is completely responsibility of the years or years of corruption and zero maintained to the hydro system. They, everybody knows the case of Derwick. Um, it's uh, and a group of sweet case company who uh, make uh, contract and trade with the regime to bring um, uh, uh, replacement and okay. um, yeah, right. it, it's, okay. it's, it's, okay. it's completely responsible. Okay, so you see it as corruption and mismanagement as to the power uh, shortages, right? Pedro, let me paint a picture for you right now. So we've got the Supreme Court making moves to take away Guaido's immunity, so he could be in jail soon. We've got the Russians sending their troops their landing. So even though 50 countries have recognized Guaido as the leader of Venezuela, he could be in jail. The Russians are there. We saw what happened with Bashar al-Assad once the Russians decided to start helping Bashar al-Assad. So is this a fight that the opposition is going to lose? Well, first of all, I think we have to focus on what the crisis is. I mean, we've got a huge humanitarian crisis that has only gotten worse because of the collapse of the Venezuelan infrastructure, because it's not electricity. Much more serious is what's happened with the waterworks. I think we're having a massive crisis, not only of availability of water, but the quality of the water people are receiving when they do receive water. This is a huge crisis. Add to that, obviously, the food crisis. This is a fundamental crisis of Venezuela. On top of that, we have a political crisis. And then on top of that, we have a show. And the show is the Russian show. Russia, I can guarantee, that knows what's going on in Venezuela better than the United States. They have invested in Venezuela, they have sold to Venezuela, and they have seen the consequences. They have lost some money in their investments, they haven't get paid back on their debt, and they know the level of maintenance and the way the operational capabilities of the Venezuelan armed forces. What came the other day in planes, after Venezuela made a payment to Russia after mm -hmm. long years of delay, was maintenance equipment to try to put back together the military systems that had been bought on the last years, none of which were really the best. Probably those deals were the ones that yielded the highest commissions for intermediaries. And Venezuela's military is full of Russian hardware that has to be maintained. By the way, that will have to be maintained even if power shifts or when power shifts to the opposition, okay. because those are assets of the Republic of Venezuela. Maybe we should never have bought them, but they're there. I do not believe that Russia wants to get involved in Venezuela. I don't think Russia will get involved in Venezuela, Alessia. I don't think even the proximity of the military p probabilities of Russia mm -hmm. being involved exist. I mean, Russia is always a threat. Russia right. will always want to be on the table. Russia is a nuclear power, but it's not a military power in the Western Hemisphere. So yep. what I want to make sure is that people don't take two planes full of maintenance people that have to come mm -hmm. and maintain a whole array of badly maintained military hardware as an invasion from Russia. All, yep. That is not true. And it's but also there was a response from the United States. Okay, but certainly, but there was Venezuela. a response from Pompeo. There was a response from Pence. There was a response from Trump, right? So it's rubbed because, them up because, the wrong because, way. Because They're angry. We're, 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 well, we, but, but, but that was diffused. There was also a meeting between mm -hmm. the special coordinator for Venezuela and the deputy foreign minister of Russia. And I think there will be another meeting. The real thing is what we're doing for show and what the reality is. I am 100% convinced, having spoken many, many times with Russian officials that they actually understand the gravity of the situation. Okay. They might want to protect their contracts mm -hmm. or, or, you know, mm -hmm. but, but the fact is that nobody who's close to Venezuela would say that we have a political crisis. No, we've got a all-out crisis. We've got right. a crisis that touches every aspect of Venezuela. Okay, Alessandro, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but we've had you on the program before, so I want to paraphrase something that you said in the past to Temir, because Temir... You say this needs to be a Venezuelan solution to a Venezuelan crisis, and you want everybody to come together and sort this out. Alessandra and others mm -hmm. in the opposition accept that, but first they believe Maduro must go because they believe Maduro has wrecked the economy to the extent that he won't be a help at all moving forward. Why don't you address her directly? Tell Alessandra why you disagree. No, I, um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't necessarily disagree. What I, what I want to be is realistic. Um, I mean, if the solution 
uh, a hypothetical solution for the crisis is that President Maduro must step down. That needs to be the end, if you will, if the, the end goal of a negotiation process. In, 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 I mean, one cannot um, request from the country to solve the problem before even addressing it. If we're going to address the political crisis in the country, we need to, we need to think about uh, feasible solutions that will involve all parties in the, uh, in, 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 in the country, all political parties in the country. So, again, I understand that some in the opposition um, might request for President Maduro to step down, but the problem for them in this case is that President Maduro is not willing to step down, and, and that's why exactly we're in, we are in a stalemate. If we want to overcome that stalemate, we have to measure, once again, uh, what are the, uh, the what is what is the balance of power inside Venezuela and try to come out with a practical, pragmatic, uh, something actionable, doable by Venezuelans in mm -hmm. in the shorter in the shortest uh, uh, period of time because we need to address as, as as it has been said you know the humanitarian, social, and economic uh, crisis that the country is embedded in. Okay, Alessandra, be practical and pragmatic and work with Maduro. We can work with, with him because we have uh, internationally proved that he is a very, very, very bad administrator. He, we don't need six more years to prove that he can solve what he creates. Because what is happening right now in Venezuela is completely uh, his responsibility. Uh, he's completely guided. It's, it's practically a uh, political state. Um, they, they are... Um, they don't fix nothing after he was appointed for Chavez in 2013. At the opposite, the, the country is getting worse, worse, worse at the point that we are right now. And of course, he wants to stay in the power because he is a uh, he is a dictatorship, as he is involved in a criminal state. It's, it's a it's a the motive is he needs to survive. The only thing that he's not going to be under the international. Um, uh, law, it's because he mm. he is still uh, in Venezuela and he wants to keep for under any cost the power okay. in Venezuela. Okay, Temi. But legally, he's not. No, again, um, I understand uh, this lady represents a, a fraction of the opposition, a small fraction of the opposition. Once again, what I'm trying to uh, what I'm trying to address is the bigger picture. Uh, Venezuela has been divided, uh, polarized during the last 20 years between anti-Chavistas and Chavistas. And we, we all know that uh, the opposition, if you will, the anti-Chavismo and Chavismo are today divided. Uh, there are many factions, there are many different opinions uh, wi wi within those, those political groups. But my impression today that is that everybody is aware uh, of the fact that we need to come uh, as quick as possible to a negotiating table, and we need to gather around that negotiation, you know, the, 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 the largest number of political forces in the country, and, and say both to uh, Mr. Guaido or Mr. Maduro and to, uh, to the international community that we Venezuelans want to uh, build our own solution. And the only, the only sustainable, stable solution for the country is a negotiated one. Imagine that the uh, government collapses. Imagine that Mr. Guaido takes over. Mr. Guaido represents, a, again, a minority of the opposition. This is a group that has only 14 uh, MPs in a 167-seat uh, uh, National Assembly. Uh, how do you build okay. a majority coalition well, okay. Okay. So you, uh, coming uh, from that? That's an interesting how do you point. address okay. the problem of the Venezuelan military? Okay. Okay. Interesting Again, point. we need that negotiated outcome. Interesting point, because you say he represents a fraction of the opposition. According to more than 50 countries, he does not represent just a fraction, but he represents the popular will, if you like, of, of the country. Pedro Mario Borrell, when Temir said that, you were shaking your head in disagreement. Tell me why. Well, it was almost everything that he said, I mean, disagreement, first of all, because I think uh, Venezuela's problem is man-made, has to be solved by Venezuela, but can only be solved with tremendous amount of aid from outside, in every sense of the word aid, from humanitarian aid to economic aid to political assistance to security assistance. I mean, Venezuela has got itself into one of the biggest messes a country has ever got itself in. When you're talking about a plan to go to the IMF, the size of the plan makes the Greek plan look small. 
When you look at the security plan, it makes Plan Colombia look small. When you look at the humanitarian aid, it looks some of the big humanitarian campaigns in Africa and the Middle East look small. So it is easy to say that we can solve the problems, except if you actually do get the right dimension of the problems, we need a lot of help. The first thing that you need is a government in place. And what we definitely do not have right now is a government. The people who are usurping government actually are denying that there's a crisis. They keep insisting that this is a made-up crisis while people are dying and fleeing. So the first issue, the first issue is that Mr. Porras' old boss that he was very loyal to is denying the crisis that he has created through mismanagement, through stupid ideas, and terrible advice fundamentally from the hardline Cubans that basically make a lot of the decisions in Venezuela. So we've got to get rid of that for the rest of the country to get together. One. Two, Guaidó does not represent Voluntad Popular. Guaidó is the president of a national assembly, the majority of which is controlled by the opposition, and they're firmly behind him. That is what politics is. That is what coalitions are. It's kind of surprising to have somebody saying, let's bring everybody together, and then talk about splitting people in little groups. That's an absurd way of looking at politics. Okay. Mr. Guaidó, even as an individual, represents himself. He's part of a party. That party is part of the opposition. That opposition is part of the majority. And that's the way democratic politics works. I have no clue what he's talking about uniting the country if he doesn't understand that little concept about how democratic politics work. OK, listen, I'm out of time, but I'd love to have you all back on the program soon. And this is an interesting test of Maduro's leadership for the moment. He's asking people for patience with the power rationing over the next month. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in the country. We're keeping a close eye on Venezuela. Temir Porras, Alessandra Polga, and Pedro Mario Borrell, I thank you for joining us here on the Newsmakers.